and I am your host today. And with me in studio today, we've got a wedding studio across the, uh, the African universe. I've got my good friends, Laduma Ngobodo from the founder and creative director of uh, Matosa here in South Africa. And I've got all the way in Nigeria, I've got my good friend Tunde Owolabi, he's the founder and creative director of Ethnic in Nigeria. I also have uh, my other good friend, Moses Turaira from uh, from Motions in the Rwanda. But Moses is, is with us all the way from from Italy. So uh, so we have quite a, a global uh, a global panelist here. Uh, before I even go too far with the with with the conversation, I've been looking at some of the messages that I've been receiving uh, on the social media. They said, "Why do you only have men on the panel?" Uh, so everybody's been, everybody's been giving me the grief about the men. I don't think I actually went for the men on the panel. I actually just wanted a Pan-African representation. I wanted the three corners, if you want, East Africa, West Africa, and Southern Africa. And um, I said to start, um, who do I know in uh, South Africa who is the leading voice of, 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 of culturally inspired African uh, work and Laduma's name came to mind. I'm sure there's many others. I similarly went to, I similarly went to, uh, to, to East Africa and said, in that region, who do I know? And uh, uh, Moses' uh, name came to mind because I know Moses obviously uh, and I know Laduma. And I also know um, uh, uh, Tunde in, in Nigeria. So I promise uh, next time around, we are going to expand this and make sure that uh, we, we include women, or rather I'm more conscious about it, but it was an unconscious, um, unintended uh, bias in, uh, uh, in, in, in this regard. But I'm excited, um, uh, to, 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 uh, I'm excited for us to have this, uh, this very first, this very first um, master, master class by, uh, by Abla. Uh, and particularly on, on, on one of the most important subjects that's going to define and distinguish uh, Abla over the years, which is uh, our work at Abla is going to be culturally inspired, is going to reflect an understanding and uh, an innate relationship with the continent that is our continent, Africa. Uh, the most magnificent continent which is beginning to inspire the world over uh, the world over in terms of creativity and many other innovations. But what came, what really, really struck me on why we need to start with this is I looked at the creative um, uh, economy, the creative industry worldwide, and said, what is the problem or the challenge that we have right now? And the first thing that comes to mind is uh, Africa represents less than 1% of the global creative economy. So if you look at this economy of $2.2 trillion, we are only representing 1%. I know, and I'm sure everybody else around the world knows, it is not what we represent, it's not what we contribute, because we're gonna talk about some of that contribution uh, in, in a minute when we get to it. I know that we represent a whole lot more than that, um, uh, more than that uh, around the world. So we're gonna talk about that. Uh, we're also gonna talk about culture, a little bit about, um, about um, 
uh, about how we begin to see a renaissance uh, or if you will, an, an appreciation of the growth in, our, in African culture being in, infused into the creativity of, into the creativity of, 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 that comes out of, uh, out of this continent. Uh, and people are using culture for many, for many reasons. Uh, one, it's uh, the one thing that I think distinguishes us around the world. Every, every country and every country has got its own culture. But I think uh, uh, here in the continent, we are really renowned for our vibrancy, the vibrancy of our, of our culture. But secondarily, I think people are using it as a sense of pride, as a sense of identity, or a mark of pride and mark of, or a mark of identity. So that's what we're going to speak a lot about. A lot of papers have been written about this. A lot of research has been done about, about, about culture, about the creative economy. I'm hoping that today we're going to have a, an interesting and exciting discussion around that. Uh, we're joined by uh, uh, quite a few people from around the continent. We're streaming live uh, from our studios in Johannesburg. Uh, and we're speaking to, uh, to my good friends, Aruma Nogolo, Aruma Nogolo, uh, and uh, to the world I've been from around, uh, from around the continent. So without uh, wasting too much time and perhaps getting onto that, is, uh, uh, I probably will start with a one minute introduction uh, to, uh, to, to everybody and, um, and uh, my connection really with, uh, uh, with, 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 with each one of them. I will start furthest north of the continent, uh, which is West Africa, and I'll start with my friend, uh, uh, Tunde. Tunde, please can you introduce your, uh, yourself? Uh, I mean, I know you and, uh, uh, and I know uh, some of the work that you do. Uh, a lot of people probably have seen the ethnic brand uh, that is um, uh, taking the world by storm from your sneakers, your bags, and all that. Uh, photographer, uh, you're a creative director. Uh, I also think you're a bit of a, 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 a copywriter because I see when I follow your work on Instagram as I say, uh, my brother here can speak some, uh, some good, put together some good uh, English words which make sense here yeah, uh, to go with this incredible, uh, incredible. Tunde Owalabi, uh, perhaps just a minute introduction as to um, uh, what you do and uh, what, what distinguishes your work. Tunde. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Tunde, thank you, Tebe. Um, hello, Laduma. Um, hi, Moses. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, my name is Tunde. I am the creative director for Ethnic Africa. Um, I, I like to refer to myself as an artist because that gives me the freedom to be whatever I want to be. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm a fashion designer or just a designer. I would say I'm an artist because, you know, um, as an artist, you have the liberty to... Um, conceive any idea and um, be able to interpret them in whatever media, I mean, you want. So I like to introduce myself as Tunde Olabi, uh, Creative Director for Ethnic, and I'm an artist. Thank you, Tunde. And I, I can see right behind you is one of your works, uh, one of your paintings, uh, because of course you also paint. Uh, and also paint. Uh, yes. <laughs> I want to go uh, furthest, uh, then I want to go into the middle of the continent, East Africa, or to the middle right of the continent, uh, East Africa, but right now, all the way from Italy, uh, my good friend, um, uh, Moses. Moses, uh, introduce yourself to those who don't know really how you define yourself and uh, your type of work. Great, yeah. Thank you, Tebe, for having me, and thank you, everyone, Laduma and Tunde. So, my name is Moses Turahirwa. I'm from Rwanda. I'm the creative director of Motions. Motions is a fashion brand, culture inspired, that's fusing modernity and the cultural frameworks. And we are bridging the present to the future to create what we can call the future heritage. Yeah, I'm currently doing uh, my studies in Italy, still in, in fashion design and I'm doing the master in collection design at Polymoda at the moment. Moses, you know, what's interesting is you didn't study as a designer, you were model at one stage, but how did you study again in college? <laughs> I did civil engineering, surprisingly, but very enthusiastic uh, of fashion. And so uh, we're grateful, uh, we're grateful that uh, welcome uh, Moses. And Thanks. then down to uh, South Africa, my good friend and brother, 
uh, a Latin man or called a Latin man piece. Uh, for those who don't know you, uh, tell them a little bit about who you are and what you do. Batuma? He's muted. He's muted, actually. Latuma? Latuma? Did he? Did he? <laughs> Greetings to the G. I can't get used to his Zoom calls. Um, greetings to you, Tunde, uh, and greetings to you, Moses and Pet Masangu. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Um, I am Latu Mangarolo, born and raised in Port Elizabeth. And um, I'd like to call myself a designer. I work in the fashion design space and interior and deco design space. Those are the two things that I'm passionate about. Um, but I also do specialize in textile engineering, which is what I studied at school, but had a great passion for fashion design. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Latu Maya. I, mean, uh, I think what's so interesting about what we're seeing about uh, with, our, with our creative uh, our people is uh, just how you guys have expanded beyond what quote unquote people would have, uh, how you have been introduced to the uh, to, uh, to the world. I mean, you, you like to buy, you do homeware, you do, um, yeah, homeware, I mean, from wallpaper to rugs to cushions, uh, and uh, your portfolio has really expanded. And we'll talk about some of the exciting things that all, that all of you are, 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 are doing out there. So to, to, uh, to start, I want to, I want to, uh, I want to uh, just to hone in into what really inspired you, all of you, to get into uh, to get into this uh, into the space. Uh, so I'm going to start with um, with, with, with Moses. Um, um, uh, I met Moses uh, I don't know many years ago, maybe was it, uh, many years ago, and I was quite intrigued about how he infuses um, uh, a Rwandan culture. Uh, the beadwork, uh, which is quite, quite a coincidence between South Africa and uh, and and and, um, and Rwanda, we we'll get to that as well. Uh, but how? What inspired you to look at your culture and say this is a source of uh, inspiration for the source of inspiration for me, uh, Moses? What what does that awakening? I mean, or had you always done this? Yeah. Uh Moses? Yeah. Yeah. While, Moses, while Moses is getting um, uh, sorted, yeah. I think Moses, Moses. Can you hear me? No, we can't hear you. I'll come back yeah. to you, Moses. I'll come back to you. Let's uh, let's let's cross over to uh, let's cross over to uh, to uh, to Tunde. Tunde, you use the Yoruba culture as part of, as your inspiration. How did it all start? I mean, when did you say this is what I'm going to be doing? Um, thank you. Uh, it, 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 I think it's it started um, in 2012 when I decided to. Um, to leave my day job as uh, as an art director in advertising, um, I, I always knew that I wanted to create products, but I wasn't sure. You know, I wanted to be, I, I, I wanted to create things. I wanted to design products. I wanted to design experiences, but um, I wasn't sure what it was going to be. And you know, as part of my training, even though I studied graphic design, uh, part of my training was um, being a painter. You know, so. I, I left um, advertising with the aim of, um, you know, exploring. Um, I traveled around Nigeria a bit, learning about the culture, learning about the, the people, learning about the food. And um, I think by the time I was done um, traveling around the country uh, and a few other African countries, I, I came to the resolution that I wanted to create something uh, Something that is African inspired. So what it was going to be. So in um, 2013, um, I was doing a research on um, 
female uh, ways of dressing in Africa with the turban, you know, the gele, the head tie, the different kind of uh, head tie. And that was supposed to be my exhibition, my art exhibition. I wanted to create images. I wanted to create paintings and, you know, do some photography. I, I still did. But um, what struck me was for all the images that I was searching for on the internet, uh, Ashoke came up a lot. And, um, you know, I started to ask questions. What, what, what exactly is it about this fabric? And, you know, images of weddings, you know, very elaborate dressing with the women with the very sky high, gale, you know, the guys with the abada, very regal, you know. So I thought, I think this, this fabric is what I want to study instead of um, um, working on or doing the research on just traditional ed style. So um, for me, I thought the, the best way to learn about it was to go to where the fabric is being done. So I, I asked questions, I asked my mom, you know, I, I had to go dig out some of my mom's old fabric, you know, just to learn about the fabric. And then uh, went into the hinterlands where the fabric is made. Um, and that kind of, you know, just sealed it for me that, you know what, this fabric, I need to bring this fabric to life. There, there's more to this fabric than just the ceremonial purposes that it's used for. And, um, uh, you know, so I, I did a research, on, I did a documentary on the fabric. I painted some images, you know, took some photos, and I had an exhibition about the fabric in um, 2014. So after the exhibition, I, you know, I sat down and I, and I was asking myself the question, what next? You know, how can we make this more sustainable? How can this fabric be brought to life? You know, how can we make it cool for the young people? Because asking questions amongst the young people, you know, they tell you, I should, why would I be actually, it's too heavy, you know, it's not cool, it's not this. So I thought there must be a way to make this fabric appeal to every other person, you know, younger people and all that. And um, I thought sneakers, you know, I thought about sneakers and that's, that was where it started from. So I made my first pair of sneakers, and um, and since then, you know, we've made thousands. <laughs> so, what, so 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 I, uh, so from you, it was uh, it was curiosity and curiosity and uh, and a bit of appreciation. Uh, so uh, Moses back online. So maybe we go to Moses and try and understand the Rwandan. I mean, it's Rwandan, but how he looked into the Rwandan culture and says he is a source of inspiration. Moses, are we able to get you back? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. All right. Uh, thank you again. I was saying that I was, um, I'm a very good observer. And then when I grew up, I was really passionate about fashion, what uh, being created, but always uh, that uh, every time I could look into fashion and the clothing, I was referring so much about the West, uh, the cuts, the suits, and uh, uh, tailoring. But I wanted um, when I started when I started in 2015, I wanted to be able to claim my own passion. So I think I looked so much about um, the cultural uh, implication of what I could do, and how do I not have the Western culture influence so much, even if we learn from them. I mean, all the uh, uh, fashion cities like Paris and uh, 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 Rome, Milan, but how do we uh, claim our own fashion? So I think I thought the only way that I could use is the implication of my culture uh, um, frameworks into um, the cuts. So I started to do the um, the research about uh, fabrics, uh, the cutting, the tearing, and see how I could combine or fuse my cultural aesthetics into that to kind of be able to create the modernity or contemporary styles. So that's how we started. I gave it a try and I was so much referred into the artisan work of Rwanda. Uh, in Rwanda, there's so much artisans, there is so much um, rich culture in artisan and craftsmanship. So I referred to that and started to, to experiment. The beadwork, the hand embroidery, uh, the, the patterns, the, 
the prints mostly what you know about like the geometric prints and patterns what we call imigongo and started to put together everything kind of create my mood board from that so I started using the Western uh, couture uh, uh, style and the traditional aesthetics. So, and then I gave it an experiment and started to work with my um, team, my tailor, and see how we can fuse both. And I think when we started, uh, it was um, a quite an adventurous approach, but it was quite well received and people started to see themselves in it because there was that, um, implication of, of the culture. And I think it, I also wanted to see what can play the, the pivotal role in um, relationship between me as a designer or, and the consumer. And I wanted that people of Africa or people of Rwanda see themselves in what I could create. And so the implication was quite a breakthrough to get the consumer um, to have this attention to, to, to us. Thank and then the, the, beat, the beat work, is that very much Rwandan, because when we segue to, to Laduma, I want to talk about the beat work as well. So, so a lot of your work has got the beat work. I mean, um, uh, so you use a bit of a uh, and all those uh, uh, um, aesthetic, but I see a lot of beat work in, your, in, uh, in much of the stuff that you, uh, that, that you do. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the beadwork is uh, is everywhere. I think it's also something we share with other uh, African countries. A lot I've seen uh, in Kenya, in South Africa, uh, but also it is a good way for me to translate my creations as I talked about the Imigongo and the, what we call um, uh, Amabara or the Rwandan, uh, the Rwandan uh, uh, weaving and uh, uh, motifs. So we're mostly in the painting or using the natural soil and uh, um, the cow dung to create these panels, but the bead embroidery and the other types of embroidery was so much inspiring to translate my idea into uh, and bring it to life. So I think that's one of the, um, uh, thing we share with other African countries, of course, and also the patterns, I see them a lot in uh, uh, South Africa, um, Kenya, in Rwanda. So I think there is still um, a link between um, African nations as the cultural symbols that we, we share, and but the use can be also different. We can use them as uh, creatives in different many uh, ways. Got it. So now we'll segue to, uh, to uh, Latuma, uh, I mean, uh, your work is uh, incredibly groundbreaking. It's uh, everywhere in the world. I think on the 5th of this month, which is uh, March, we are coming to America, we'll break worldwide, we'll open worldwide. And uh, Eddie Murphy, uh, Nong Zamo, and a whole lot of other people are wearing uh, Matosa. Uh, what inspired you to, uh, in your days at university, to say, I need to use my culture? because you went even further deep into the culture because you went into an area which is, one could say, sacred, um, uh, the tradition, the circumcision tra tra uh, tradition, because you went and borrowed from, from that part. And uh, it's sort of an, an insight into a very personal part of, uh, of, of a culture. What inspired you to switch, uh, to use that as an, as an, as an, as an inspiration? Thank you, Mr. T. Um, on my side, what inspired me to focus on culture as a design source of inspiration was, um, as you mentioned, a project that I did as a thesis project at the Nelson Mandela University in 2010. And back at that time, I just um, 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 finished my initiation as a crosser initiate. But uh, as a person who has been growing up in a home where my late mother was super patriotic about culture, she literally read anthropology books to us on a daily basis. Uh, so culture became something that was familiar with us. Uh, we grew up making curio products for, 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 for curio stores around Port Elizabeth. And um, at that time, 
the feeling that I got as a person that studied textile design in high school and as a person that started hand machine meeting when I was 15 years old, I felt like with the knowledge that I had uh, as a person that appreciated fashion, I felt like uh, the clothes we, that we wore as Tosa initiates was not cultural enough. Uh, they felt more English, like the hunter caps and the, and, and the English jackets and the loafers that we wore didn't really re resembled or celebrate our culture. In fact, um, those type of clothes were a form of being accepted in a colonial territories in the Eastern Cape where people plowed, uh, where they had jobs to plow um, 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 vegetables and fruits. So for me, I wanted to change and reverse that history and get Kosa initiates to be actually be able to celebrate their own culture. But in a modern context, it was also a, a, a taste type of choice because I personally loved Italian fashion. I personally loved French fashion, um, specifically luxury fashion. And so I decided that with the resources that we apparently had in Port Elizabeth, that is the wool industry, that is the biggest in the continent and the mohair industry that we have as the biggest in, in, the, in the world, I wanted to take those raw materials and create something that is unique out of them, of course, I had to look for a source of inspiration. Uh, and for me, it was a no brainer to go for a bid work um, that the Crosser people started doing in the 1800s. And fortunately, there already had been a lot of archives that were available in museums. So I went to museums and researched and realized that I'm part of a clan that created different um, 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 aesthetics in terms of the style of hippie work. So with the, with, with the information that was there, I realized that there's, there was plus minus over 200 clans, different clans, and each clan had their own styles. So therefore I saw an opportunity to establish a brand that is based on this aesthetic, but can resemble what other cultures in Africa have come up with as an idea of a beadwork, colors, patterns, and shapes. I then decided that culture will be the base of the brand. And when I traveled to the UK for the first time in 2010, I also realized as well that the African diaspora or the luxury industry and the fashion industry in general didn't have any brands that were aspirational, luxury brands that were aspirational for black people or whoever to purchase as an alternative. Um, the choices that were there were either Asian uh, or Indian or, or, or American or European. I felt like it, this was a time now to actually experiment with our own aesthetic and, and pitch it to the world and just care what they think. Thank you, Dadima, for that introduction. Uh, and congratulations again uh, for, for having your work uh, be, uh, uh, be featured uh, so prominent in the, in the upcoming uh, Coming to America movie with, uh, with, with, Eddie, with Eddie Murphy and, and many of our leading uh, 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 actors around, around the world. I want to actually, while we did, now that you've got a context in terms of how you all started, you know, uh, whether uh, whether it is a uh, curiosity, whether it is research, uh, whether it's all those, all of you seems to be all of you are not seem are very invested uh, uh, in, in, in our culture, uh, and all of you seem to have come, uh, all of you came from your own culture, so you didn't go to anybody else's culture. I mean, you uh, large enough from my course, uh, Tunde from the from the Yoruba uh, tribe, and then. Um, Moses uh, from the uh, broader uh, Rwandan, uh, Rwandan culture. Is it possible, by the way, to is it, is, is it possible to appropriate your own culture? And I'll give you an, I'll give you an example uh, uh, and why I'm asking the question. So when a young man uh, recently is one of the successful designers 
uh, from South Africa. When he decided to launch uh, uh, Shibelani, the, 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 Tsonga, the, the Tsonga traditional dress, and, and pitched it at, um, at uh, $3,000 uh, 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 for sale, everybody started saying, uh, everybody started saying uh, he is across, or not everybody, somebody said to me uh, on Instagram says, uh, he is appropriating uh, our, our culture. We are used to getting that culture for cheap, for 300 rand or for 10, 15 uh, dollars. Now he wants to charge us so much money. We don't accept it. Is it possible to appropriate your own culture? I don't know. Tunde, let's start with you. Is it possible to appropriate your own culture? Well, no, because um, first off, it's it's not, um, you can't really place value to it. You know, um, you're looking at the culture and you have taken the culture to refine it, to create something that every other person did not see um, from that culture. You have taken the culture, it's, it's like taking coffee beans and making it into coffee. And then, you know, you've taken, given it to different brands and they, you have the Nespresso and the rest. That's the way I see it. You can't say because it's our culture, then it's supposed to be cheap. Because even back then, it was not cheap. I remember when I was um, doing my research on Ashok, okay, you know, I was talking to some of the elderly people that I used to uh, weave the fabric. And they said to me, um, for you to get married in, in the olden days, you needed to have Ashoki. If you don't have it, you have to go and look for someone who's got it, probably work for the person to hire their own for you to wear. If you are going to become a chief, you must own Ashoki for you to be able to be ordained as a chief. So the fact that you see it everywhere doesn't make it cheap. There are different levels to these things. You know, so I, I don't see it as being appropriated. So, so from your from your end, Laduma, because um, because of the three of them, you really went deep. You really went deep into the culture. Do you feel that you appropriate or exploited something that is so sacred about your culture? And uh, and I don't have a view on it. I'm just out of interest. Is that for me? Me? Are you referring to me, Mr. T? Yes, because you went so deep into the culture. Because you know, everybody who went to the culture broadly as known, you went one level down, one level deep, or not down, one level deep, and you brought that yeah. to the public. Do you feel like you have um, uh, exposed the culture or, or, or taken something that belongs to everybody and now you've quote unquote commercialized it for yourself? Um. For me, uh, to come back to the general question that is, you asked whether it's, a, it's, it's possible to appropriate culture, my opinion is yes, it is possible to appropriate your own culture. Um, I see it in a sense that I could have made the wrong decisions about my own culture and my own people would have been angry at me. Like for instance, I, I would have, imagine if I took production value chain of my course and, 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 and outsourced it all from China, uh, my, my people would have looked at me differently as a capitalist. Um, but then I chose to struggle instead. Uh, yes, there were commercial, like big commercial opportunities of manufacturing the clothes elsewhere and letting other people um, make decisions on my behalf or sell 80% of my, my, my business to, to an investor that will make the, the, the final calls at the end of the day that are commercially based. But um, I, I chose as part of my policies of my company that I want to be relevant to the culture first, that is the closer people. Um, I want to be relevant in terms of my own country's economy. I want to be relevant in the education element. Um, like, for instance, uh, my work gets featured in, 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 in high school, primary and university education. So the positivity that I wanted to bring was that I want to be part of a new system of unlearning that culture is 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 less 
than, than any other culture in the world. Um, those were the positives that I wanted to, 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 to contribute within the culture. Uh, I'd like to believe that I made the culture better. I exposed it um, even more because um, still a lot of people are, are learning how to pronounce Makosa properly. And um, offshore markets that we've, we've explored as well, uh, didn't really know about the Corsa culture, but they knew about Nelson Mandela, uh, but they didn't know where to position him within the South African cultural context. So um, um, yeah, to conclude on your question, Mr. T, I, I think it, it is possible to, to appropriate your own culture. Um, there is also an element um, that ultimately a designer has to, that I felt that I had to do, was to go and consult with Imonaki. I got an opportunity to actually meet the 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 the, the, the Kosa King, uh, King um, Zuelonke himself, and gifted him a piece uh, just to hear his opinion. I've met other kings as well of other clans of the Kosa speaking nation people, and they love it. Um, there hasn't been any negative uh, feedback. Ultimately, I'd love to to have. A, a, a handcraft facility within the Eastern Cape where people can produce like items of value that are even more valuable than what I already do as my cost. Absolutely love, I love that perspective. And I want to I want to ask Moses the same question, but I'm gonna put a spin to it. Um, Moses, uh, I've seen the president of Rwanda wears your your your, your clothing now, uh, well among many other people around the world wearing your, your, your clothing. Uh, and Ladma said something interesting. He said it's about education as well. Uh, not many people know about Rwanda, the, 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 the many parts of Rwanda, other than the fact that it's always been one of the fastest rising economies, one of the well run um, our, our countries in the last uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, but I think through you, do you feel like uh, you are not appropriating it? Uh, you are perhaps educating people a lot more about the culture of Rwanda? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Te uh, Te Tebe. Um, I think on my end, as really uh, when we looked at the concept of the culture and appropriate, um, appropriating the culture, I think people always get uh, um, misunderstood or hard because I think for the culture, it's what are we doing with the culture? How are we adding the value to the culture to create? So it is uh, an implication that has to come with recreating or adding value to, to the culture. And I don't see that as uh, appropriating the culture because this is something we are part of that we, are, we really feel like we belong to. And as I said, we have to, our fashion, if I go so much into the, the, the fashion and creating, it only has to rely to this, um, our fashion language has to rely to this uh, cultural symbol. So it's our task, it's our, uh, in our capacity to be able to translate it however we want, referring to that. We are artists, we are uh, free people, I mean fashion designers and creators. and. So we have to use the culture, of course, in a good way, depending on also how you structure your business or how you want your brand to be seen. But I don't think I do. It is possible to appropriate it, but on my end, I don't think I uh, appropriate the culture. And I think I just add the value and recreate and uh, kind of harmonize the cultural symbols and the uh, aesthetics to to bring it to the world and to the people that I I, uh, I serve. And, 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 and yeah, and, and, and it's education. I, I love that uh, uh, both those comments in terms of uh, what, um, uh, what what increasing that culture does in terms of taking it out uh, into the world. So linked a, a little bit uh, uh, to that, and I want to go to Laduma. It's um, with this movie, with the movie coming out on the 3rd, we see uh, obviously there's going to be an excitement around around the seeing uh, seeing African uh, creativity or fashion or talent as well because it's talent in both ways 
both acting talent as well as our, our craft talent with, our, our, with the work that we're going to see in there. We are seeing uh, the development of the world wearing the rich uh, We see, we see seeing a, a range of people around the world uh, wearing all three of the all, all, all three of the world. Now, do you think this is a a fair? Is it a fashion or fall? Is, is it going to pass? Or do you think we are here to stay? I don't know. I'm 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 worried whether now we are the latest greatest uh, until uh, some other continent comes up with something else. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Mr. T. Actually, um, when I used to live in London, like I, I used to talk to a few um, um, showrooms. Uh, showrooms are meant to distribute products for me to boutiques around um, their territory. So one of the opinions, uh, well, it, wa it was actually a popular opinion in the fashion industry at that time that the African aesthetic is a trend, was a trend for that season. I think it was 2016. Um, and I used to tell all of them that I beg to differ. Uh, culture cannot be a trend. Uh, if, if that's the case, then French culture or Italian culture will, will be a trend. Um, but I think this whole wave is, of course, dependent on how certain brands um, position their, their, their entities. Um, yes, there is a, a big hype, but uh, what I would ask myself is the hype based on us African people being involved in a value chain. If we are not, then that 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 hype will come in and out because what would then mean is that we are not decision makers in the fashion industry. We will still remain the one percent um, of the of the whole value chain. But um, if we get to go as far as getting involved in retail. Um, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a brand that opened up a boutique last year in New York called um, Daily Paper, of which was a huge statement for them to make. The three guys are from Africa, Ghana, um, and one is from Ghana, and the other one is from, um, I think, Ethiopia. Uh, they made a bold statement and opened up in New York. Then it then means that they are not a trend at all. They are an, an alternative um, um, brand. So people could either buy Prior Moss or buy Alexandra Wang or DKNY or CK in New York, basically. Um, but um, nevertheless, not even looking outside the continent, we've got a growing middle class that is growing faster than our consciousness. And that is a market that is set for us, um, and I, it is a market that is a first priority to my market as well. A lot of people often think that Macrosa is targeted for overseas markets, um, but they get surprised when we tell them that 90% of our market is actually South Africans and people from neighboring countries as well. So Moses, who's buying your stuff? Who's, who's, who's buying your, your, your clothes, uh, your designs? Uh, just building on Ladumas' comment, is it um, Rwandese, Africans, broadly, or is it um, mostly export? Great. I think uh, I've, we haven't really been uh, exporting as much. I think our, ma our market definitely is based 70%, um, 75% of Rwandans, and then 15% uh, of Africans. Uh, living in African countries or diaspora, and we have a very small percentage of uh, um, uh, clients who are from like the West who probably buy online. But the biggest market we have is Rwanda, so it's always the. Sorry. Why are they buying your stuff? Why? So what is the is that what's what's inspiration for what's the motivation for them? Are they buying it because? Um, uh, it's Rwandan culture, or because it is fashionable, or because it's the latest thing that everybody's doing. So really, really, 
Great. I, I think it's both. It's uh, both, as I said, because they see themselves in the creations. They see themselves uh, be, uh, in what we create because it has these cultural symbols, uh, the cultural aesthetic on it. But they buy it also because it's beautiful and it's um, close to them. I think uh, it's not like in the 50s, people used to travel to go to Paris to buy their uh, fashion, uh, their, their fashion pieces. Now it's also about how do they support the local brands and the brand that's near you that's doing amazing work. So it has to be involved in what is the quality, the beautiful work that you are doing and also the fact that they see themselves in what you're creating. And where, that's where the cultural um, implication kind of manifests because they see themselves in what we are creating. But also I'll talk uh, uh, a little bit about also how the fashion industry generally is being redefined and where we talk about uh, is it going to be sustainable, uh, this attention maybe to the African brands or to the African uh, uh, culturally inspired brands. I think there is a huge um, fashion scene and as we saw how the fashion be, been revamping and getting redefined, there is always the, um, the evolution of fashion from countries where it started from France, then Italy came in, uh, UK, United States. And then I think it is not a bad thing that it could be the time for uh, Africa to kind of claim it's it's raw, it's uh, and it's force uh, because we have a huge drive, also uh, generating from the culture um, that need to be celebrated, that needs to be seen. So the question will probably come after: How do we maintain this? How do we maintain that Africa? As, uh, Africa's claimed role in the fashion industry can be sustained. Uh, it needs to be sustained. It will come on how we start to study and look beyond on how do we keep this, um, how do we keep it up there. So I think there is a lot to 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 manifest. There is a lot also to explore, and. It's up to us to be also more creative and create and be able to, to, to prove to people that we can do it. Also not referring far from the culture and the, how we imply uh, everything because there is an emergency and then we have to be, um, to stand out to stand out as a, as a creative force, a new creative force that kind of emerging there. Uh, African in the fashion industry in general. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much uh, 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 for, for that, Moses. Uh, Tunde, uh, the Nigeria has probably got the largest diaspora anywhere in the world. So, uh, are you? Is it Nigerians in Nigeria who buy your stuff, or is it the uh, the diaspora who are buying your things? Who buying your or your stuff? Um, it's it's mostly uh, Nigerians in Nigeria. And um, so because the Nigerians in Nigeria have bought them and introduced them to the ones in diaspora, it has now become something that um, um, those in diaspora also want to be a part of. It's, it's, you know, them trying to, or rather them wanting to um, be, for lack of a better way of putting it, they're trying to represent, you know, their culture, trying to go back to their roots and being identified with um, where they are from, you know, with their culture and all that. So it's it's mostly about 75% Nigerian, um, uh, and then the rest, you know, the rest of the world, basically. I think what's beautiful about, what's so beautiful about this conversation and, and understanding is that um, it's our own people supporting us. And to me, that's, uh, that's, where, that's where perhaps we ought to be, we ought to be to be headed as a start because if we don't appreciate where we come from it's going to be very difficult uh, for us to get anybody else to appreciate of course a lot of people do appreciate what we do sometimes in ways that we don't like uh today how did Ni the nigerians react when jamie oliver made jollof 
I mean, it's just the same way we react to Ghana when Ghana made Jonathan. <laughs> 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 so, it's a kind of to of, 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 of in Nigeria or Ghana. <laughs> Because Nigerians believe that um, if, if you do not, I, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear that. Can you think, did it feel like somebody is taking away something of the country? Well, well not necessarily. I mean, there were, there were different opinions, you know, but the, the main thing is this is not our Jolof. This is not what our Jolof looks like, you know. Um, some people feel like they're trying to recreate it in their own way, which in itself, it, you know, it's, it's not a bad idea, but um, Nigerians just believe if it's not Nigerian jollof, it is not jollof. You know. So if it's not made by the Nigerians, it's not, it's not jollof. It's not jollof. <laughs> so, so uh, Laduma, I mean, we've had, we had lots of um, controversies, uh, uh, even, in, even in South Africa with, uh, with people taking uh, our ideas, uh, so uh, our ideas and, and recreating them in some way. How did you feel when I um, mean one of the leading brands um, uh, copied your your socks? I mean, it's a global brand, and they took your your sock um, idea and reproduced it. Um, perhaps uh, it created a lot of controversy around here. How did you feel? Did you feel that? You've been robbed, or did you feel that you've been uh, what you've done has been so appreciated? Everybody wants to share it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I of course uh, uh, felt robbed um, because number one, I didn't benefit any profits from it. Um, number two, I wasn't consulted for it. It became a surprise that I got from customers, um, and. People thought that it was legit. Some people thought that it was a legit collaboration because the design was exactly the same. So for me, those type of um, um, gestures, I see them as, 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 as misappropriation uh, and rather not um, 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 a form of flattery. As people say, being copied is a form of flattery. Um, um, I don't believe in that at all. But um, And some people say that if you've been copied, it means that you are you are making it. Um, from what I, from my thoughts, you know, I thought that Zara probably thought that um, I'm a very small brand that is starting out. I'm a startup that is still trying to make it in the industry, and therefore, no one would notice. Um, but yeah, uh, nevertheless, being copied is something that I get at least every six months. And um, people still prefer to buy from, 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 from our brand directly because um, of the quality and the name that we've upheld for the past 10 years. And um, as Tunde said, if it's not cooked in Nigeria, it's not Jollof. And the French also believe the same thing. If, if, if it wasn't brewed and bottled in France, it's not champagne. Uh, and therefore, um, brands should be that possessive about their belongings and 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 and, and, and try to build that, that DNA that will make people insist on buying the original. Uh, uh, I'm going to steal that. Let's go to my new line now. Uh, if it's not cooked in Nigeria, it's not jollof. Uh, if it's not brewed and bottled in France, it's not champagne. So. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm not best. It's going to be my, my, my new line that I'm going to be using whenever I talk about uh, I, I talk about this. So I want to get back to the concept of value now, uh, of value, and I will go back to the earlier conversation I brought up about um, about uh, Rishin Nisi's Ashibela, and and, um, and I think um, you guys started talking a little bit about it. But I, want, I just want to get a little bit to this discussion. When, and I use perhaps, but it's not a culture inspired idea, but when Tepo jeans decided to sell his jeans at 590, South Africans were very, very upset. They said they can get the same jeans for, for 500 rand, or what, $50, $30 from, uh, from Markham's, 
uh, they were not interested in, in buying this. But as soon as as soon as soon um, Meghan Markle came to South Africa and bought the same jeans and, and bought the jeans for herself and for Prince uh, uh, Archie, all of a sudden there was a rush towards uh, uh, getting several jeans and they were prepared at this time to buy them for, for three to four times uh, the price. Do you feel that um, there's an underappreciation of the value of anything that is created by Africans, especially when you go back to the comment of Rich and Mrs. Um, uh, Shidela, and where people then begin to think, especially if it comes from our culture, nobody has the right to put a higher price because they can get it, uh, they can get it cheaper. Now, by, by, no, by all accounts, you are not cheap. You are known to be a premium brand, and you, are, you have no interest in, in being a, um, an entry-level brand. You see yourself as a premium brand, Alongside the, the, the Hermeses or the Missonis, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, to network, uh, neither are you um, a Moses, uh, and neither are you Tunde, because I wear all your clothes. Uh, so I know for certain, uh, you guys, we cannot find you guys in the flea market, and we cannot find you for 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 for, for less price. Do you think there's an underappreciation or an undervaluation of of, of African? Um, of made in Africa. Let me start with, uh, with, with Moses. Moses, have you received a lot of resistance to your pricing? Yes. Yes, thanks, Kebe. Uh, I've received a lot, and uh, I think every... This is something we are now used to, uh, I think. Um, but in Kenya Rwanda, we say there is a, there is a proverb that says, Owamba uh, ichirezina menya kochera, uh, Ichirezi is like a pearl. It's it's a beautiful pearl that's in the tradition. So whenever you're wearing this that's, that pearl, you think it's common or you think anyone can get it, and you do not um, recognize how white it it must be unless someone sees it on you. So that's the kind of translation. So I always tell people because um, uh, you do not have to wait for someone overseas to appreciate our work you, the work that you have near you um, so that you can be able also that you can be convinced to to buy it or to make sure that it's uh, it's worth it so i think it is in the um, in the mindset uh, that needs to change that even if you can easily see it even if I am your neighbor, even if we grew up together, you have to see the, that ability of transforming and the work that is involved um, to create something. So I always get this comment uh, on Twitter, or a lot of on social media, it, it is Rwanda and it should not cost this, but <laughs> we do not, uh, and we don't, have the government sell, uh, setting the, the prices for the brands and uh, involving the creative work and the craftsmanship and everything. There is so much energy that needs to be valued that is put into the work that we do. Uh, so much energy, so much work, and then I feel like it will be so much pleasing. It will be so, uh, creatives will always be grateful to have the appreciations coming from the their own people first. So I think this is something we need to encourage and it's really uh, common that we get that. It's the matter of mindset that needs to change. Now, do we need to bring down the prices of Matosa or you are pretty, you, you are where you ought to be and we need to come up to where you are? <laughs> so. um, my prices can only get higher. Um, uh, I believe that the, 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 the subject of value versus price is a negotiation space that brands should have with, with customers. And I wouldn't even dare put the blame on, 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 on our people for complaining about prices because um, the three of us are in the business of exchanging value for, for, for resources um, when I say so, I mean that with, 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 with pricing comments, um, people think of three things. They think of the aspiration behind it that, you've, that you, we have to create with marketing. They think of uh, the quality 
on how long it's going to last them. And they think of the feedback that they're going to get from people on how beautiful it is and whatnot. For me, um, there has been customers that would come up and say that, oh, that's a garment with patterns. I'll get someone else to do it for me. And then they walk off, get someone to do it for them. And then that person promises them a lion and then <laughs> present a cat to them. You know, so um, that is when customers understand value. Um, when they've faced a difficulty to actually reach the, 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 the aspiration that I have promised them. As you always say, uh, Mr. T, uh, a, a promise made is a promise delivered. And unfortunately, in the space that we operate in, um, we get victimized by the track record that other brands have promised the people and disappointed them in the past. Now we have to be guinea pigs of that and, and actually show people times three or times five that we will give you something that is more than the value of the price that you're gonna pay us for, 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 your, for, for, our, for our piece. I, I, I absolutely appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, and I, I mean, I know your brand. I know Moses' brand. I know Trudy's brand. You guys have never ever disappointed. You always delivered uh, on your promise. Uh, Today, Nigeria is quite a wealthy country. People pay in dollars. They walk around in proper dollars. So I don't think you have problems about uh, about how much you charge in dollars. Matter of fact, your prices are in dollars. I mean, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, they come to realize that it's not it's it's not about um, just the price. It's about the value that you're giving. And like uh, Laduma said, you know, we're we like the guinea pig for some of the brands that have under that have overpromised but under delivered in the past. But um, right now, um, it's it's amazing to see that a lot of people are beginning to see the value. Um, and um, how things can be done in Africa, you know. So now the appreciation is a lot, and people are willing to pay, you know, whatever price that you know the, your, your commanding. Um, even though some still say, "Oh, it's not Gucci, it's not this," but you know, you you end up saying to them, "You can either go buy the Gucci, or you can buy this. It's not going to reduce my price because I'm not reducing the quality and I'm not reducing." The value that I'm giving to you, you know. So it's. Uh, <laughs> I think we just need to continue to educate people about how things are done, and um, you know, let your value, let your value proposition, let the quality of what you're giving speak for itself. I, I, I believe, you know, um, with um, Laduma, with Moses, you know, I believe what we produce actually speak for themselves, because. Um, for, for someone like me, I, I hardly do a lot of marketing, but when people see the product, they're willing to, you know, they ask, where did you get this? And they're willing to, you know, put their money down to, to, to get one for themselves. And like Laduma said, it's an aspirational brand. You know, people look at it and some, some even say, oh, I like this, but I need to save towards it. And, you know, it's, it's like what um, this guy said, uh, Tom Ford, you know, we're in the business of creating desires. So we create this desire and you know people come for it and they're willing to pay whatever you're you're charging. So we haven't really had pro we haven't really had a lot of problem with, with pricing, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, Moses spoke earlier about the government is not putting prices or value on, on things. But he said he had a question about um, the support. Uh, how important has it been um, uh, for, 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 for any of you, for, for all of you, to receive, and if you have at all, uh, support from government or cultural institutions run by government, uh, because I think you're doing an important work for, for the continent, for the country. You're promoting the culture. You are creating an appreciation of the culture by, uh, the, by the locals themselves. You are... Um, and, and you, you are just telling the story of who we are in the most elegant and the most exquisite way in the world. 
Uh, that um, how other than just sending a tweet as governments tend to do uh, whenever you receive an award or any of you receive an award or any of you um, uh, are appreciated elsewhere in the world, we'll then see ministers uh, and other government officials send out tweets congratulating you. Other than those congratulations, how have they supported this important cultural work that you are doing? Maduma, let's start with you. Or have they at all? But maybe you can also answer whether it's even necessary or important or whether you care about it. <laughs> I think it's very necessary, Mr. T. Um, uh, you in that space, you would understand the magnitude um, of, 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 of having a, a, a big muscle behind you. Um, I mean, the, 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 the fashion business is worth $2 trillion. And um, the market share that uh, we simply ask is a very small percentage of, the, of that $2 trillion dollars and um, to unlock some of those opportunities we need resources from the government the most powerful being cash injection but um, if there isn't you can appreciate being given resources to fly to territories and explore and research or to fly to ter other territories to go and do sales or go for marketing avenues but um the, 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 the cash injection priority hasn't been delegated much by our own government. Um, we hope that it will be better in the future. I haven't benefited from the direct cash injection, but um, trade shows and fashion shows and other marketing um, missions that are for overseas markets and even local ones, like back, but back, back in the day, I've, I've taken advantage of those opportunities. They don't call you to come and apply. It's a voluntary service that you have to literally walk in and out of those offices of the government and, and tolerate being, 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 being mistreated or being undermined um, and, 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 and be patient with it. Um, so I've been patient with, with, with all of those um, and, and, and support systems that the government has, has has had but of course i know very well that south africa has those funds available but for well-established businesses then there are turning over millions of dollars that want to scale up heavily interesting um, i mean I was, quite, I, I was quite intrigued by the choice of words uh, that you have to be patient uh that you have to be tolerate being mistreated and um but eventually when you know uh, uh hopefully they uh, they help uh, moses how how how, how what, what is your thought around the role of government um uh and how they treated you uh, in, in this space thank you tebe um i think for the rwanda the rwandan government is um really really supportive i want um i'll come back to uh, finance injection later on, but I think there has been a lot of um, initiatives that helps um, creatives, uh, not only in fashion, but also in a core um, creative industry. There has been uh, like a, what we call um, a Made in Rwanda campaign, which is a huge campaign uh, initiated by the government, uh, the Ministry of uh, Trade, uh, Trade Affairs, so this, with this initiative, I think brands, locally manufacturing brands being able to, to succeed by the awareness, uh, making their awareness through these campaigns of Made in Rwanda, because there was a push. Um, this is something I really appreciate from uh, uh, the Rwandan government. There's a push and a huge campaign around the Rwandan people to support or consume local uh, products. So even if it's not like a direct injection into my, um, a, a direct money injection into my business, but it's a huge uh, platform um, to, of awareness for people to know what I am creating as a brand and being able to consume my product. So I feel like that relationship between uh, me as a 
creative designer or um, a producer to a consumer being much enhanced by one of this uh, one of this uh, made in Rwanda campaign. This is something I think the Rwandan government been able to achieve and also bringing uh, so much like trade fairs and supporting some of the creatives who are doing amazing things to um, unlock their potential in terms of uh, um, capacity building, sending to trainings or schools. Uh, I think it's something that contributing positively to the creative uh, industry. And when we speak about the creative industry, the fashion industry comes among the tops. So this is something I think the Rwandan government has been able to achieve that's been very beneficial to uh, local brands. I've seen it and uh, appreciate it as well about, about the government of Rwanda. I really many really times uh, myself. So uh, to the end, uh, from your end to the end, what are your thoughts on, on the space? Is it necessary? Uh, I mean, it would, be, it would be nice to have, um, like Oduma said, to have some muscle behind you, you know, especially um, not just the financial side of things. Yes, the finance is very important because we need the money to, you know, to grow. Uh, but, you know, we also need policies. We also need to be able to trade, you know, into African trade, um, you know, being able to export what we do um, to other parts of the world so that we can end the hard, you know, the, 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 the foreign currency. Um, but unfortunately, like, I'll, I'll speak for ethnic because um, it's been bootstrapping all the way, you know. Every cent um, we, have had, we have had to, you know, uh, work for by ourselves and um, do everything by ourselves without the government um, putting any help. Um, you know, so if if we if we are able to get that kind of support, uh, imagine what we would do if if we had that kind of um, muscles behind us. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, we're still here, uh, still trying to do what we can in the absence of this support. And hopefully one day, you know, they, they will come knocking on our door saying, you know, this. This opportunity is here for you to take. I mean, we, we hear about um, um, opportunities here and there uh, for people to take advantage of, but like you know, like you know, when you and I are having a discussion, you know, it's, it's all about who you know and how you can gain access to where that opportunity is, which is which is you know the the, the bad side of it. Um, if if it was thrown open and you get these opportunities based on merit, based on what you do. Um, it would have been easier, but um, if, if you don't know one auntie who knows the government officials, it's a problem. The problem with about our country is that you always need to know somebody. But I just look at some of the comments that are coming through. Uh, uh, my brother uh, Andrew O.K. Okay, is from Nigeria, but he's based on the other side of the Nordic part of the world. So when I saw him there a few years ago, I said, what are you doing here? You are going to, your melanin is going to melt. Uh, but uh, but luckily he still uh, he still uh, he still has his memory intact. He says um, the fact that it is your culture does not mean that it has to be cheap. I think we can appreciate uh, 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 that comment. And another comment from Tuso Montana from South Africa he says um, for a while there's been a call for Africans to be proud of who we are. So what better way than to take your own culture and heritage and showcase it to the world? I appreciate. Uh, uh, those questions. Let's have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm gonna comment that have made. We've got a, a, a couple of questions um, uh, that have also come. I'll just take a couple of them. And one is from uh, from Luma Chica. Luma says, "How much does or did the choice to localize your value chain affect your 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 rate of production?" That's so interesting question because uh, I'm sure you've all made uh, decisions about where you produce. Uh, where you can find the materials that you want to produce, that you want to uh, that, that are going to be a component of your of your work in your country, or whether you need to export, or I mean rather whether you need to export production, or whether you need to import uh, uh, the materials. Nothing I mean, you make most of the stuff in in PE, so that hasn't been uh, hasn't been, has it affected you at all, or do you have other choices you have made? Um. Um. I still produce majority of my products in-house here in Johannesburg. 
and some of them are produced in Cape Town, some produced in Deben, and some produced in Lesotho. Um, but the compromise that I take as an entrepreneur uh, in terms of choice where I produce from uh, is, 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 is rather a compromise of a profit margin. So I, I do compromise a certain percentage of my profit margin. Had I chosen a cheaper territory to produce from, um, I would have made much higher um, profit margins, but uh, it is a compromise on, 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 on a brand as well. Like, for instance, I, I, when I started initially, I didn't want to have more supply in the market than the demand that was out there. And that's a number one rule of luxury. And um, you, when you produce from elsewhere, you can't even control the production or the IP. Um, so for us, yes, it is very expensive to produce in South Africa. Um, one of the factors is that our labor laws is, 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 is very strict in South Africa. Uh, so with the minimum wage and the working conditions that workers have to work in, um, those create like a lot of overheads. Um, like for instance, right now I'm, I'm, I'm standing on 75 employees. And um, if I take my production elsewhere, I'd have to retrench majority of them and, 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 and focus on, 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 on the profits and the sales. Oh, that's such, I mean, it's uh, obviously a patriotic uh, decision that you had to, uh, uh, to make. Uh, Moses, how has this affected you? Have you had to make choices? Um, Moses? Yes. How about choices have you had to make uh, in terms of uh, sourcing and production? Uh, in terms of, uh, and how has this affected, um, how has this affected your productivity or your production? Yes. Uh, I think we, uh, as the brand, we are really rooting for uh, for slow fashion, if I can call it, because uh, our production is uh, uh, kind of limited, and then we prefer, uh, and our brand values is that we produce everything uh, in Rwanda, though we still outsource, like as I said, as referring to um, the fabric uh, materials, uh, that we outsource, but then we have a, a goal to outsource by 2025 uh, everything in Africa. So we still outsource the fabrics in um, African countries like Senegal and uh, Egypt and uh, um, India for the for the uh, some of the fabrics. But the um, manufacturing, assembling, everything is done in our atelier in Kigali. And this is the thing, this is the structure that we have to, to stick to because it speaks much also about um, the artisan work and the culture of having everything made in Rwanda or um, assembled uh, in Rwanda. And then in the future to aim to have also everything that we outsource in terms of materials and uh, um, fabrics also in Africa. So it's not like um, I didn't have, we didn't have a choice, but also we stick to the uh, brand's identity and the strategy that we building as telling uh, our story of our, our pieces. Uh, today I've seen, I've obviously seen you, your product, I've seen all three of your production of, of, of places around the continent. And, um, and I know it's, um, craftsmanship is very important to you. Uh, has that, how has this affected you, uh, having to produce everything locally in Nigeria, or and not necessarily as in whether I've got a view on it yet, but it's just to uh, try to understand your philosophy in terms of why it's so important for you to produce where you are. And then the sourcing of the fabrics, I mean, you go all the way to the north to make the fabrics, uh, but you, you bring in some of the components. Yeah. Um... It's, it's really important for us to produce in Nigeria because, uh, first off, you know, we're very artisanal. Um, secondly, 
I'll, I'll give you an example. COVID made me realize how important what we do is. And the reason is because, um, you know, because the, the, the weavers who make the fabric, because, the, you know, the fabric is like the core of our uh, product. And the weavers who make the fabric, if we don't give them uh, jobs to do, you know, they, they probably get jobs from other places here and there for people who want to get married or people who have, you know, important ceremonies to, to do. And I realized that with COVID, they didn't get any other job. Nobody was having parties. Nobody was giving them anything to do. And they became very idle. And, you know, that was like a wake-up call to me that what we're doing is really important. Because that means if tomorrow people decide that they're not wearing this fabric anymore for ceremonial purposes, <clears throat> then they would, have to, they would have to fall back on us to, you know, uh, bring the jobs. But again, it's, it's really important for us to, to produce here because um, one, we want to keep the jobs here. Uh, like Laduma said, if we decide to go produce maybe in China or somewhere, it probably will be cheaper. And, you know, I, for one, will have less headache because all I need to do is create the design, send it to them, have them produce it, ship it back to me, and I can sit down in my house and sell, you know, just find a distribution or um, distribution chain and just send them out to sell. But it's, it's really important for us to produce here also because we need to develop the, the skills. We need to develop the manufacturing industry in Nigeria because it's, it's dying as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's really difficult to find a good shoemaker or you know, a cobbler who can sit down and actually craft uh, professionally. Uh, and that's, that's becoming a problem. But if we produce here, we're able to have some sort of a, an internship program where we also train young people and bring them up. And that way, um, for us as well, the brand is able to grow and we're able to sustain the brand, sustain the artisanal art, and um, also sustain the, the production of the fabric, which is the most important thing for us. Thank you, thank you for that. So the last few questions, some of the just steps, I'll just ask one one. Uh, to be, uh, I won't ask all of you the same question, just one uh, one question to each one. And uh, perhaps as I see, uh, as, as I've seen, has been quite prominent in your in, 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 in your brother Asama before. I'll start with um, Laduma as a wrap up. Uh, Laduma, I mean, you showcased at New York Fashion Week. You, your work is available in boutiques in London, uh, in New York, uh, uh, in many other places. How important uh, what approach have you taken from the marketing, which says as rapid up in a minute or so? How important, what approach have you taken from, from taking the brand out to the world from a marketing perspective? And how important has it been? Sorry, Mr. T, you, you froze a bit. Can you repeat the question? Oh. I think that um, uh, your work is available in London, it's available in New York, in some of the finest boutiques. Obviously, it's known, it's worn by some of the uh, most well known uh, celebrities. What are some of the two or three things that you've done for marketing globally to take your brand out to the world? Um, first of all, um, personally, I've boycotted the idea of commissioning PR agencies to to make you aspirational or tell your story. Um, I've always believed that telling my story myself will be more legit and authentic. And uh, I've done that well through responsive invites that I've gotten from around the world, from conferences and schools that I went to speak at and from magazine features that I, that I got. But uh, for me, the, 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 the people on the other side received what I do as a more um, for, for my voice and not someone else telling the story. And some of the avenues that I've taken to market my brand was to use digital tools such as social media, website, and um, Google, and other platforms to make sure that people can find us easy and people can read about it easily or share our story with another person easily. So those are the two marketing 
avenues that I've, 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 I've always pushed on. And also maintaining communication with relationships that I already have with, 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 with public figures or, 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 or museums. There are museums that, that have approached me to collect our pieces or exhibited them or just buy them as part of their collection. That has kept us um, 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 being spoken about and, uh, and, and, and there's a marketing rule um, 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 uh, that says that you constantly have to remind people about what you do and not assume that they know. So every season and every year and every week, we remind people what we do because people easily forget we live in a saturated digital world um, next thing you wake up, there's other people that are doing things that, of course, are not in your industry, but they will shift the focus. So we had to be present in the movie space. We have to be pe present in music videos and um, in, in, advert in adverts. And um, our politicians, where they are fighting in parliament, um, my cluster piece is there as well, you know, so those are the industries uh, that we've tried to push the envelope in. So we have to be present and present you have been about uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, I think the, the biggest presence this year is going to be that movie and it comes out on the fifth and we're looking forward uh, to, uh, to that movie featuring a lot of your probably your finest art pieces. Um, the last question, uh, second last question goes to uh, Moses. Moses, uh, 2019, I think, the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement was signed in Rwanda by African presidents led by Your Excellency Paul, um, uh, Paul Kagame. And uh, the objective there was really about driving intra-Africa trade, which is very low right now at 18%, with a goal of 50% by 2030. How is this going to help a brand like, uh, like, like yours and other brands in the continent, and how you see uh, perhaps other brands as well around the continent? How's that going to help them uh, uh, to, for growth and for exposure? Or do you, do you think it's not going to happen at all? Do you think it's going to open it up for what? Exploitation for other people copying your ideas? I don't know. What, what, how, how do you see this? What's going to happen? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for local producers to be able to take this space and um, uh, own it. and produce because as I mentioned through the campaign, that's where there have been uh, policies that um, kind of uh, um, to sustain what is being locally produced. So it was in that aim that they banned like the second hand clothing. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to be able to sell what we are creating because uh, I would say uh, creating is one or creating fashion, but who wears it? And then I think this is um, contributing a lot to to our um, selling and our incomes in terms of uh, if the secondhand clothes are banned, we have to provide options. So if uh, people of Rwanda looking for options, how to still dress well, not in a um, and Nord or Western uh, brand, how uh, are we able to occupy that space to provide uh, what Rwandans can wear? It's a, an opportunity for the brand, but uh, for motions, especially in the clothing sector and also other brands that are um, manufacturing locally. And I think it has been a huge encouragement because since that, uh, the um, fashion industry or the production industry been revamping and evolving so much so it was a huge encourage for the local people to start thinking uh, creatively and also how uh, they can create jobs out of this opportunity so there's a lot of jobs that have been created by locals and um, for locals as well so it's a it's a huge it's a huge injection and indirect injection for the uh, Rwandan uh, South uh, economy and for the brands and the, uh, everyone who's producing and um, manufacturing locally. It's obviously going to open up the market as well for you to be able to export your uh, your brands to other parts of the continent. Yes. Make people yes. Able to, uh, 
to travel, but like you say, uh, it, it uh, also take the London rent uh, across the market. Last comment from Tunde. I was going to say a minute, but um, I'm speaking to a Nigerian now. Uh, a minute may be, um, may be stretched. Um, how is, you know, with COVID-19, we pretty much had to learn how to, 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 how to rely on technology a whole lot more. How has this helped your or impacted your your ability to market to sell uh, your brand? Has it, has it been a hindrance, uh, or did you miss the days pre COVID, or or have you got an absolutely new avenue now to take a brand to the world? Well, you know, with um, with our brand, we've always um, it's always been very much digital. Um, so it, it 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 wasn't some sort of a shock to us. It was just a uh, we're continuing what we are already doing, but knowing that, that that's the future and we need to concentrate a little bit more um, and take more advantage of the digital space, um, leveraging technology. You know. um, COVID was just some sort of an eye opener saying, oh, you're on the right path, just continue, basically. Um, the only difference is the fact that um, we are unable to now have um, trade shows, you know, where people can actually come and feel the brand, you know, because that really helped at, you know, post, sorry, pre-COVID. Um, that really helped because um, trade shows gave people the opportunity to actually interact with the brand, get to meet the founders of the brand, you know, feel the product, um, you know, learn about the product, see the products without, you know, because some people still live, um, I wouldn't say still live, you know, in the cave, but, um, they still have something against buying things online. So they always want to, you know, see the product before they can make a purchase, which is okay. And um, that's one of the reasons why we had to, you know, really work ourselves hard to make sure that we open our first store this year, which we did in January, um, you know, for people to come in. But um, ordinarily, we, we rely on technology to push our brand, you know, we rely on technology to do our marketing and um, like we do not say we use technology to get our story out you know to, to the world because that's that's the only way you can sit down here in Nigeria and you know you're talking to someone in Australia showing them what you do. Um, so <laughs> why not technology you know basically and that, that gives a wider reach basically. Uh, with, with that um, I really want to thank you uh, uh, Babatunde out of Nigeria, the founder of, uh, of, of Epic. I want to thank you so much, Maduma, the founder of Matosa in South Africa, uh, Moses, uh, uh, Moses uh, uh, the founder of Motions out of, uh, out of Rwanda. I think that today is the continuation, I don't want to say the beginning, the continuation of a conversation we should always be having and a, and a mirror we should be holding to ourselves in terms of how well we are representing our continent and how we're telling our story and most importantly how we're owning our story and I think that culture and by us integrating it into our creativity uh, 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 is really about us telling our own story and owning and owning um, uh, our story. I think it's what, like what Chino Achebe said, if, um, if, the, if the lion does not tell, if, until the lion learns how to tell its story, in terms of the hunter will always be glorified. Michelle O'Hara says, note here, uh, a comment, and I think this comment really speaks, I sent a comment to Laduma, but I think it's a comment that really speaks to everybody, uh, that your authenticity is an example uh, that, um, that, that all brands can learn from. Uh, speaks of, she speaks about the, the importance of relevance and humility, which are integral to your story. I felt like you're speaking to all of you because that's how I felt uh, 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 today. I felt that um, uh, you, 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 you brought your passion, you brought your authenticity, uh, you brought your humility, but most importantly, you are flying the African flag. Until the next time, my name is Tebe Nkalabeng. I'm the founder of Africa Brand Leadership uh, Academy, and here we are looking to uh, to sharpen the minds of the people that build the brands that build the continent. Until next time, have a lovely one. Thank you. Guys.